Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Haynes. I teach AP US History at Hewitt Trustful High School. I'd like to take a few minutes here to briefly give you a guide on how to take notes in AP History, as well as how to prepare for multiple choice questions. To the left, you are seeing the cover of the AP US History course and exam description. This is a very large book, but it's very helpful. It tells you everything that you need to know about the AP US History course and the curriculum. Um, you can simply search in Google, as you see up there on the top right, a push CED. Um, I often refer to it as the CD, but just Google search that and you can find a copy of it. It is large, but it's also super helpful. Inside the CED, you're going to find a series of topic pages. The topic page tells a student exactly what we should learn about in class. It explains the learning objectives or the tasks and the historical developments that are needed to complete it. A topic page in the CD provides a learning objective that you see on the left, which tells us the skill we're going to be having to perform in class for this particular topic. And the question is, how do we perform the objective skill? Well, you got to look to the right, and to the right, we're given historical developments. The historical development points out the content that helps us perform the task of the learning objective. And so I always like to tell students the best way to study for a class is to take a topic page, find the learning objective on the left, and then turn it into a task or a question. And then you use the historical developments that are over there to the right to answer that question. So I also encourage students to annotate the topic pages. Uh, they can do that in a variety of different ways, and I'll explain what that looks like here in a little bit. But you want to annotate the topic pages as you learn the content. You want to try and turn the learning objective into a question, and then maybe write a short explanation in the margin to make the connection very explicit. This way of studying and reviewing the content does parallel how the AP exam is created. So the writers of the AP US History exam are actually looking at the same topic pages that you have before you. So it's a good idea to be familiar with them. This is an example of what an annotation might look like for a topic page. And this student is actually from an AP World History class, but AP World History and AP US History are structured exactly the same. So it does serve us as a good example. You can see that they've turned the learning objective into a task. And then to the right over there, the developments, that's where they're gonna get a little bit more explicit, more specific as well. So you can see what the student's doing that's really good is they're taking the development piece by piece rather than trying to absorb it all at once. And I like to do this in class as well. I'll kind of uh, read a part of it, then stop and then elaborate a little bit more and then go back to it and read some more. So you're seeing over here, for example, in blue, this student has highlighted a part of the development that they were going to expand upon more and they drew their blue arrow and they've given examples. So that's what you want to do with a topic page is as you're studying, as you're reading, you want to take the, the development piece by piece and then elaborate upon it with multiple, multiple examples. Um, I will tell you that each and every multiple choice question that we get in class, they are all going to be tied to these historical developments. Sometimes the answer choice is just a rewarding of the historical development. So they are incredibly helpful in studying and preparing for tests. I want to use topic 2.7, this topic page, uh, for our example here in the next few minutes. Uh, why is it 2.7? What does that mean? Well, the 2 stands for the time period that we're studying, period 2. And then 7 is the topic um, that we're uh, learning about the, for the particular day. So 2.7. You can see as a theme, we're going to be learning about American and regional culture. The topic is colonial society and culture. Our objective to the left we have two historical developments and um, let's work our way through some multiple choice questions here so to the left i've got the historical development and it says the british colonies experienced a gradual gradual anglicization over time meaning they've actually became more british but they developed autonomous political communities based on english models with influence from commercial intercolonial commercial ties, the emergence of a transatlantic print culture and the spread of Protestant evangelicalism. So to the right, you have a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Um, what I always like to tell students when they're doing multiple choices is this, start by reading the question first. So we'll read it, it says, Whitfield's impact suggests that religious culture among British North American colonists in the 1700s was most directly shaped by 
oftentimes you look at that and you're like, okay, do I need to read the quote? If you remember a lot about Whitfield and um, this really famous pastor from the 1700s, then you might want to just go straight down and answer the questions or try and work your way to the correct answer. If you feel not so sure about George Whitfield and you don't remember much about him, then it might be helpful to go in and read the quote. These quotes and these pictures, uh, the stimulus part of these multiple choice questions, they're not there to frustrate students. They're there actually to, to be kind of a safety net for students that maybe don't remember as much. They want to they need their memories jogged. Uh, that's what they're intending to, to help with. Uh, to give you a little help and a little clue. So let's uh, try and work our way to the right answer. If you need to read the quote, then maybe pause the video, but I want to keep marching forward through this video. So working our way to the right answer, uh, there's going to be two answers that are just flat wrong. They're irrelevant, but if a student has not studied for the test whatsoever, these questions, these answer choices might look right. So for B, there's nothing in this quote about commercial and business this is a very religious and faith-based quote. Uh, there's not anything about agriculture and crops either, so these two can be eliminated. Watch out for a distractor. There's always gonna be a distractor uh, answer choice in these stimulus questions. It's gonna look like it's accurate, it's gonna look like it's right, uh, but there's a reason for why it's wrong. So for one, it's a true statement from history, but it's not related to the stimulus. And so um, I like to think about it almost like this, apples and oranges, uh, whether they're, they're both fruit, that's true, but they're two different things. So in this case, this, uh, the, the answer choice, it might not be related to the, to the quote whatsoever. Um, another thing is this, a distractor might be a true statement, but it happened in a different time period. So for example, this quote, I know for sure, even though it's not dated, it's definitely from the 1700s. Um, this would be maybe a true statement, but it happened in the 1600s or it's a true statement that happened in the 1800s. So students need to watch out for that. So we're gonna work our way to the correct answer. Um, before we do that, let me just mention one thing about A, Roman Catholic influences. Whitfield was a Protestant pastor. Um, maybe if a student chose the distractor, they're gonna do that because, well, they it's a religious quote. It's, it looks similar to religion and so forth. Um, but that doesn't work well with George Whitfield because he was not, he was not tied in with the Catholic Church whatsoever. So uh, that's not going to shape the things that are happening in that particular quote. So C is going to be the answer. Uh, Transatlantic exchanges. The deal with this one, as you see over there, I've got it highlighted with the CED over there. Transatlantic print culture, the spread of Protestant evangelicalism. So Whitfield came from England over to America. The First Great Awakening, this movement that he was a part of, came from England over to America. And uh, that's how it's going to be more so tied to the, the historical development. That's what it means by transatlantic exchanges. You know, transatlantic exchanges do not include just crops. There are other things like ideas, and religion, and, and faith, and those sorts of things. So I hope that that makes a little bit of sense. That's tied to the development. Let's look at number two of her. Whitfield's open-air preaching contributed most directly to which of the following trends? Have you noticed that a lot of these questions are looking for just simple causes and effects? A uh, large portion of the questions you'll get on the actual AP with sister exam will do the same. They're looking for causes and effects. So um, let's work our way to the correct answer on this particular one. Uh, the growth and ideology of the Republican motherhood movement, that is um, irrelevant. That's all about raising young uh, children to become good American citizens. That's not related. Movement of settlers to the back country. This quote about faith and religion is not really uh, has anything to do with that. And that brings us down to a 50-50 chance of getting this question right. Um, the distractor is going to be the pursuit of social reform. A student might look at that and say, well, these people are part of the church. That's what the church does. They're, they're a part of social reform. But this open-air preaching is going to create, it's going to contribute more, uh, more closely with this greater independence and diversity of thought. And why would that be? Well, you just got to go back to the historical development. You can see that highlighted right over there. Intellectual exchange. It was enhanced by the First Great Awakening and the spread of European Enlightenment ideas. So you can see that independence and diversity of thought. Um, that's certainly what happens with the First Great Awakening. People came to believe if you could make your own personal decisions about God and faith, 
uh, that you could make your own decisions about politics as well. So that's one thing we studied. And we'll look at one final question over here. The preaching described in the excerpt is an example of which of the following developments in the 1700s. And so we're talking about open-air preaching, very popular pastor, uh, Reverend Whitfield. Your two irrelevant answers are going to be A and B. Uh, this quote is not really about, um, you know, self-government or anything like that. Uh, you don't see anything about uh, the abolition of slavery or anything like that. Uh, this is very much about, you know, preaching and people becoming interested in going to church. The distractor would be the increased influence of the Enlightenment with this particular one. But it, I want to go back and tie it back to the, to, to, for, for answer D, tie it back to the development over there, the spread of Protestant evangelism. Um, that's going to be more so tied to the historical development. So that's why this is just so important to really kind of emphasize um, those historical developments as students are studying. So as you can see right over here, this is from the College Board. Um, they align everything to the uh, historical developments. It says key concept over there. And um, key concepts, historical developments, they're kind of interchangeable. But each multiple choice question is directly aligned to the CED. And the same will be for my test in class as well. So uh, just as a, ever, as a reminder for students, uh, they can print off our class notes. Those are available in Schoology and Google Drive. Um, they can print them off and they can annotate if they would like. They can print off the topic pages from the CED. Um, I've digitalized all of those and they can print those off if they would like and just annotate like you saw earlier. Uh, you can annotate the CED uh, via their digital notebooks. That's also a possibility for students as well. Uh, that's in a Google Doc. They can access that through Schoology. Or some students just like to handwrite their notes. Uh, they, they're very specific with things. They'll title their, a page of notes, topic 2.7, and then they'll kind of go through and write down the examples as we go through in class as well. So um, those are some pieces of advice that I'd like to share with you. Um, if you still have some questions, feel free to let me know. I'll be glad to help out with anything and everything that I can. Thank you so much for listening.